instead I want to, um, I want to focus today um, on, uh, we talked about last time, we had talked previously about uh, this salutation of John, and we talked about um, the uh, God the Father, first of all, then we talked about Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Now today, we're moving to the third member of the divine trinity, and that is the Holy Spirit. And I, here's where I'd like to spend a little time because this is very important. So, Revelation chapter 1, and uh, I want you to notice here what the Bible says um, back in verse 4. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now, I want to point out to you today that um, this idea of seven spirits is a very crucial and important idea in the word of God. Um, there are numbers in the Bible that are very important. Um, the, the number three is a very important number in the Bible. It's the number of the Trinity. It is the number of the component parts of man. Um, you have a body, soul, and spirit. There's a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, and, and I could go over and over and over the different witnesses of the three that we find in the Word of God. Five is the number of grace, um, and uh, it's a very important number. Seven, and that's what we want to focus on today, seven is the number of completeness. Completeness. So when we talk about seven, we are talking about something that is complete or fulfilled. Now, God starts right off in the Bible with seven days of creation in which he creates the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested. He rested because his work was over. The seventh day is the day of completion when he completed all of the work that he intended to do. Now that doesn't mean that God is finished with the world. He continues to run the world. He continues to maintain the world. But there is no more creative acts taking place. So when we find the word or the number seven in the Bible, it has to do with completion or perfection. Now the Bible introduces us to God the Father in this passage, unto him which, which was, which is, and which is to come, and unto Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the princes of the kings of the earth. But now we come to the third person of the divine trinity, which is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is identified in the book of Revelation in particular as the seven spirits. Now, does that mean that there are literally seven spirits that God has divided himself instead of a trinity? We now have ten because you have Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and then the seven spirits. No, we still have a trinity. But God, and I'm going to show you from the Old Testament how that God makes himself, the, the Holy Spirit is in fact pictured in his sevenfold perfection. So we'll look at that, but I want you to notice this because this is very important. If you look at chapter uh, 1 and verse 4, we read about the seven spirits. If you go to chapter 3 and verse 1, and let's just turn there, chapter 3 and verse 1, we read, Unto the angel of the church of Sardis write these things, which hath the seven spirits of God, all right? And then turn over to um, chapter 4 and verse 5, and we read here, And out of the throne proceedeth lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And then turn finally over to chapter 5 and verse 6, chapter 5 and verse 6 and notice what the Bible says here um, 
And I beheld, and in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth unto all the earth. So this is a figure that John is going to regularly use to speak of the seventh fold per perfection of the Holy Ghost. And so I want you to look with me at this. Let's look at um, this thing. And if Kenny, you'll advance the slide one more for me here. Um, seven reasons the seven spirits of God is the Holy Spirit. Number one, he is included in the Godhead. In uh, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, we have the Godhead. Uh, we have the Father, we have the Son, and here in this passage we also have the Holy Spirit, who is called the seven spirits of God. Secondly, he is called the seven spirits only from a heavenly perspective. If you'll notice here, all of these passages, every one of these passages takes place in heaven. John is caught up and he sees this vision. Um, when we read in chapter 3, John is standing before the, the candlesticks and all of that. Uh, and, and then in chapters 4 and in chapter 5, we have uh, the, the heavenly throne room pictured. When the Holy Spirit is pictured in the, uh, in the New Testament and particularly in the book of Revelation as the seven spirits, it is only in heaven. Why? Because this allows us to see the fullness and completeness of his manifestation. Down here on the earth, and Jesus made this very clear, the Holy Spirit would not speak of himself. Down here upon this earth, listen, if you hear somebody say, this is a Holy Ghost-centered church, you can put it down, it is in error. Why? Because the Holy Spirit never draws attention to himself. The Holy Spirit always presents Christ. And wherever you find people who talk about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, I want to tell you, you can be sure the Holy Ghost is nowhere near around. Why? Because he doesn't speak of himself. He draws attention only to Christ. Now one of the things that first drew me to Pastor Kenny was that he never wanted his name to be seen. He wasn't interested in drawing attention to himself. And that is very much like the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit, though fully divine, though fully God, is not in the business of promoting himself. And only in heaven do we see his full power. Do we see his full glory. Here he's veiled. Now he dwells in you and he dwells in me. He gives us power. He gives us assistance. But the Holy Spirit is grieved when we talk, spend time talking about him. He wants us to spend our time down here on the earth focusing on Jesus Christ and lifting him up. And I want to say this to you today. When we get to heaven, we will see him in all of his glory. What a glorious day when we will have the presence of the heavenly Father when we will see the person of Jesus Christ and we will sense the perfection of the Holy Ghost. Isn't that wonderful, friends? And that's why the seven spirits here are, in fact, the Holy Ghost. Now, I want you to notice something. If you'll turn the next slide, Brother Kenny. Um, I want you to no notice some of the key words in the in the uh, book of Revelation. The word and, and you'd expect that to happen because things are moving quickly, right? And this and that and that. We had a girl in our church in Indiana. Um, she had the, the, the fastest mouth I have ever met uh, anywhere. Uh, Sarah Lucas, um, Sarah Young at the time. She married a Lucas. Um, no relation, but... Uh, 
that girl could talk, talk, talk. And when you sat down and talked to her, it was and this and that and, 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 and. And you just walked away. Your head was ringing by the time she was finished. Well, that's exactly what the book of Revelation is. It is one train uh, that is moving very quickly from the beginning point to the end point, and it happens over and over again. So 1,200 times in the, uh, in the book of Revelation, it's and, 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 and. It's like a machine gun moving. The next highest word as far as frequency is great. And you'd have to understand, these are great things that are happening. There are great angels. There are great uh, uh, saints. There, are, there is a great Savior. Uh, there is a great heaven. There are great judgments. And there is a great white throne at the end. And 82 times in your New Testament, in, in your book of Revelation, it's going to use the word great. But I want to mention here that 54 times the word seven is used. Now, God is trying to tell us something by that. That is that things are going to be brought to completion, to be perfected. And friends, let me say something to you today. If you want perfection, you have to go to the person of Christ. You have to go to the Word of Christ. You have to go to the program of Christ. It's perfect. And by the way, let me just say, God's Word is perfect. I, I said it this morning earlier. I'll say it now, and I mean it with all of my heart. I don't set in judgment on the Bible. The Bible sets in judgment on me. And if there's something I don't understand, it's not the Bible's fault, it's my fault. And I need to come in conformity with the Word of God. I, you will never hear, I, I guarantee you, you'll never hear Pastor Kenny and you'll never hear Kevin Lucas correcting the Bible. The Bible doesn't need correcting. It is perfect. It is settled forever in heaven. And I want to be very clear about this today. It is complete. You don't need anything else. It is complete. And then finally, the word throne there is used 46 times, and it speaks of authority. Who is running things? Look, you think it's Obama? You're wrong. You think Trump is going to be in charge? You're wrong. You think it's Putin? Everybody thinks Putin now ran the election. I want to tell you something. That's wrong. I'll tell you who's in charge. That's God. And my friend, let me say this to you today. You can sit there and tear your hair or cry your eyes out as all these millennials did when Hillary lost. Uh, and I'm sorry if, if that offends you or anything. I didn't mean to be offensive by it. But my friends, just get over it. Um, but I want to say this to you and, and be very clear about this. God's running this world. And there is nothing that's happening that ought to give us any anxiety because, friends, the next thing we're going to hear is the trumpet. So I'm not really worried about the Trump. I'm worried about the trumpet. I'm not really worried about um, the election. I'm worried about being one of the elect. I'm not worried about what is issued from Washington. I'm worried about what's issued from heaven. And therefore... Um, and, and Brother Greg and I were talking about this the other day. He was talk, he's been emailing somebody that he's been working with and, and dealing with. And this person said, well, I'm reading lots of commentaries because I don't want to depend on what men have to say. And I told him, I said, you know, br Brother Greg, you ought to send him back a message and say, do you know commentators are nothing but commentators? I mean potatoes. Uh, uh, they, they, they put their pants on the same way you and I do, and they're just as wrong as we are. You know, it, it amazes me, and, and Pastor and I have talked about this many times, Miss Terry. Um, I'm sitting looking at a passage of Scripture, and I'm pulling my hair and saying, how, does, uh, how do I understand that? I do, that's, this is too deep for me. This is too hard. I know I'll get Dr. Smell Fungus's book down. And I pull it down and I look at it and he doesn't know any more than I do. I look at it and say, wait a minute. There's not, he went right over it. Where, that rascal. 
And you know, when I learned that, it was a great day in my life because I realized for the first time I didn't have to depend on somebody else's book. I could depend on this book. And my friend, let me recommend, I, I, I own commentaries. My wife will tell you I've got more commentaries than, than I've got hair right now. But, but I want to tell you something, friends. There's only one commentary that you can really take to heart, and that's this one right here. Get yourself a good King James Bible and sit down and get your face before God and say, God, teach me. And I promise you, he'll teach you. So there's a throne there, and he's on it, and he's running things. All right, Brother Kenny, if you'll advance the next one, please. Now, I want you to look at a verse of Scripture with me. Um, look at Isaiah, uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, please. Isaiah chapter 11, and we're going to read verses 1 through 10. Now, I've been doing a lot of talking, and I'd like somebody um, who has a good voice to read Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10 for us, please. Who'll do that? Brother David, will you do that for me, please? All right. Chapter 11, 1 through 10, and I want you to note verse 2 as we do it. The whole passage for us. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. Thank you, Brother David. I don't know about you, but when I hear that passage of Scripture read, my chill bumps stand up. Um, that's a great passage. Now, I want to show you the sevenfold Spirit of God, and it's found right in this passage. So first of all, uh, if, you, if you mark in your Bible, will you mark these terms here? First of all, um, and this is exactly what John is referring to when he talks about the seven spirits of God. He is going back to Isaiah chapter 11 and he is referring to this passage of Scripture. Um, and uh, I want to just read uh, these for you here this morning. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding and the spirit of counsel and a might the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. So let's, let's uh, underline those. The first one is the spirit of the Lord. The second one is the spirit of wisdom. The third one is the spirit of understanding. The fourth one is the spirit of counsel. The next one is the spirit of might. The next one is the spirit of knowledge. And the last one is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Now let's look at these. Um, I, I'm running out of time, but I, I'll get a few of them done. We'll finish next week. First of all, let's start with the Spirit of the Lord. Now you'll notice here in your Bible, if you would, uh, look at chapter um, 10 or chapter 11 and verse 2. The first one is the Spirit of the Lord, and you'll notice that the word Lord here is all in capital letters. 
Now, anytime you see the Spirit of the Lord, anytime you see the word Lord in all capital, uh, it means what? Somebody tell me. I've taught this before. God the Father, but most specifically, Jehovah. Jehovah God. This is referring to God the Father as Jehovah God. All right? Yahweh. That is the word. Now, it is the Hebrew word, I am. It is the, the verb to be. But it's used as a noun here. And so when he says he's the spirit, the raha, of, uh, of uh, Yahweh. Yahweh means he is the eternally existent God. Look, if I were to get in a time machine and go back to the beginning of all things before there was any time, before there was any angels, before there was a devil, before there was anything else, and I were to get out of my time machine and stand there at the door of eternity would meet me God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And if I were to get in that same time machine and go until time shall be no more and heaven and earth uh, flee away as a, as a scroll rolled up and I stand in the new Jerusalem at the beginning of the eternal day that will know no day, no close, it will be forever, I would find him there. In other words, yesterday, today, and forever, wherever you are, wherever you be, he's already been there. Now that's encouraging to me. I don't know about to you, but there's so many new things today. Um, it's starting to get to where my daughter knows more about technology than me, and that scares me uh, because there are things that are coming up that... Um, I used to be on the wave. I used to be on the crest of the wave and people would come to me and say, you know, this, I need to know how this, oh, I, I can show you because I, I grew up with these computers and all of that. But it's passing me by. So many new things are happening. I, I wondered what would happen if my grandmother would wake up um, from her sleep of death where her body has been sleeping now for, um, uh, since 1977. Um, I wonder if God would let her come back from heaven and re-inhabit her body just for a moment or two and I were to show my grandmother around, she would say, what a brave new world with such creatures in it. Um, I, I, you know, uh, grandmother was born in a time when horse and buggy and uh, she said the first time they ever saw an airplane came, they thought the book of Revelation was happening. Uh, and they all ran to the church and started praying. They saw a little biplane fly over. And, and they, were pray they thought the book of Revelation had occurred. I wonder what my grandma would think now. I just wonder what she'd think now. But I want to say this to you today. Yesterday, today, and forever, God remains the same. Amen. And so number one, he's the spirit of the Lord. Number two, he is the spirit of wisdom. That is kama, kama. It is the ability to deal with situations correctly. The ability to deal with situations correctly. Now, um, I'm going to show you after I finish this, but I have to tell you now. These things match. If you look at the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, those two things match together. Um, those are, are bookends. One is, is uh, the Lord's presence and the other is the Lord's majesty. And they, they fit together. Um, if you look at number two, the spirit of wisdom, that is kahma, the ability to deal with situations, we find that spirit of knowledge goes with that one. And that is the ability to discern by understanding. So uh, first of all, you discern by understanding and then you know what to do about it. Those two fit together beautifully. The spirit of understanding goes with the spirit of might. That is to be able to sort things clearly in your mind and to be able to do something about it then. But you know what stands right in the middle there? I, I love that. Uh, the Bible says the spirit of counsel uh, because it means to be able to go safely where you need to go. And with the Holy Spirit dwelling in our heart, we can be safe. 
Now, I'll go over these in some detail next week. But I, I just wanted you to, uh, well, maybe not, uh, is it next week that we, but, well, anyway, next week I'll go over um, these with you and let you see this. But this is a remarkable passage. But this is exactly what John is referring to, and we'll look at each one of these in detail. Now, if you need these notes, these are on uh, our website under the Bioma Notes, Revelation 1. You'll find it there, and you can just download them and uh, print them off, and you'll have all of the notes, and you can study it over this week. Let's uh, bow for prayer, asking God to bless us. Brother Carl, so good to have you back. Uh, would you lead us?